Getting out, please take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. The title of my message is, The Last Time I Saw Him, He Was Alive and Well, and He's Coming Back. That's kind of a, a lengthy title, but that's the title uh, to my message here today. Now, we're going to start at 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll read verses 1 through 8, and then pray and get into the message. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, were saved by the gospel that he preached. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So he's getting sarcastic with them. You didn't believe in vain, did you? Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. All right, here's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. The gospel means good news. Now, there are other gospels, but the Bible says that if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So there's a lot of other gospels that are being preached today, but if they're preaching those gospels, they're cursing and damning people's souls to hell because there's only one gospel that can save because that's what the text said in verse 2, by which also ye are saved. Now notice, this is not the Baptist opinion. This is not the Methodist opinion. This is not according to the Catholics or according to the Presbyterians or according to the, you put the name in there. This is according to the scriptures. Amen. You say, where do you get that from? Well, let's read. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. What? According to the Baptists. That, oh, it doesn't say that. According to the scriptures. Amen. So what we're giving you today is God's word of the gospel. And the gospel is not simply the death and burial of Jesus Christ. It is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So at the time of the writing, I think it's self-explanatory, but I'll say it. At the time of the writing, there was above five hundred brethren who had seen Jesus Christ at one time, and the greater part, in other words, the, the bigger part of the five hundred were still alive at the time that Paul was writing it, so you could corroborate if he was lying or not. Verse 7, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last, last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So the title of my message is, the last time I saw him, he was alive and well and coming back. In this list of people that saw the Lord Jesus Christ uh, come up from the dead, Paul says that he's the last, and last of all, he was seen of me also. Usually, if you have a missing person, they always try to ask who saw him last. And whoever saw that man last, they really do a lot of investigation into what did you see when you saw him? Where was he? What was his state of mind? Uh, what was he wearing? And they, try, they really ask the last guy to see him, what, tell me, where was he? And they put a lot of emphasis on the last person that saw him. So today we have an entire chapter where the last man to see the Lord alive tells you that he's alive and well and he's coming back one day. All right, Father, we're going to have fun this morning just talking about the resurrection of our Savior. Oh, Lord, it sure is good to be saved. I'm so glad I, I know that this life is temporary. May the Lord Jesus Christ be magnified today. Increase Jesus Christ. Decrease Josh Stevenson. These people came this morning to hear from you. Lord, may the Holy Spirit minister to the souls. Father, I pray that the seed of the Word of God would go out and find itself on some good ground. If there's somebody in here who came searching, they came searching, looking for how to be saved, may they find it today. Father, may they realize that salvation is simple. Lord, it's not in works. It's not in something that you do. It's in what in Jesus Christ already finished on the cross. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for the resurrection, for without it we have no hope. Bless thy servant now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
All right, now I want to look at this. The last, uh, the last man to see uh, Jesus Christ alive was the Apostle Paul. And he says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he understands who he is. He realizes as we get ready to look at this guy, just because he saw him last, he doesn't have any special qualifications. As a matter of fact, if you looked at his qualifications, he had been persecuting the church of God, quite the, quite the, the, the um, background to be coming from. Verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. We can all join Paul in saying that. Uh, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So understand that as Paul has given this to you, and he labors, and he labors abundantly, even though he, uh, he worked, it wasn't him that's doing the labor, but the Lord working through him. All right, verse 11. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. And so now, I'm going to preach to you this morning from what Paul writes here uh, in, the, in the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection. The first thing I want to say about the resurrection is I want to talk about the importance of the resurrection. The importance of the resurrection. That's found in the next few verses, in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So if we're preaching that Christ came out from the dead, how come there are people that are preaching that there is no such thing as a resurrection from the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Now notice this is a resurrection of the dead. There's a general resurrection one day where everybody will come up. But the thing that people have a hard time wrapping their minds around is there's a resurrection of the dead. Most people don't have a hard time believing in a resurrection from the dead, but they have a hard time believing in a resurrection of the dead. Uh, what is that? Well, a resurrection of the dead is where Jesus Christ came up. He came up uh, uh, from the dead, and a resurrection of the dead is where everyone uh, uh, comes up at one day at a general judgment. I think I got those two uh, swapped when I was uh, explaining it. All right, so let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's set it straight here. All right, what's a resurrection of the dead? It's where all the dead come up. A resurrection from the dead is where Jesus Christ, the dead are still on the ground, he comes up from the dead. We're singing the song, up from the grave he arose. Did Jesus Christ come up from the dead? Amen. Absolutely. That's what gives us hope. All right, verse uh, 13. But if there be no resurrection, uh, but there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If Jesus Christ didn't come up, no one's going to come up. And if Christ be not uh, risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he hath raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. So if there is no resurrection, we're lying. Do you realize that? Every preacher in town, if Jesus Christ didn't come up, every preacher is a lion, just false witnesses. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. This is why the resurrection is important. It's important. Why is it important? Because a man who claims to be able to save you from the wages of sin must be able to defeat death himself. If Jesus Christ couldn't come up from the dead, what makes you think he can give you eternal life and bring you up from the dead? Did you guys realize what separates Christianity from everybody else? Is our founder is alive and well. <laughs> you already know that. I talked with him this morning. <laughs> uh, if you want to destroy Christianity, I'll tell you how to do it. I'll make it really simple. Here's how you can do it. You don't have to find any, uh, you don't have to uh, study hard. You don't have to uh, get good arguments. All you have to do is just produce the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You produce the body and it all falls apart. Everything falls apart, but you can't produce his body. You know why? Because he's alive. He's alive. All right, a man who is able to save you from the wages of sin, who claims that, must be able to defeat death himself, and Jesus Christ defeated uh, death. Now, no one comes up unless Jesus Christ had come, had come up. And by the way, there's no, no atonement 
for your sins if Jesus Christ didn't come up. Notice it says in verse 16, For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. If Jesus Christ didn't raise himself from the dead, you would still be in your sins. There would be no atonement for your sins. You say, why? Because he'd be just like the rest of us. If he couldn't defeat death himself, then he wasn't who he claimed to be. Who he claimed to be was God manifest in the flesh. And God himself shows up manifest in the flesh and sheds his blood on the cross, Amen. defeats death, and comes back. Amen. Yeah, you can have hope. <laughs> but if all he did was talk a good talk and never came back up, then we're, we're still in our sins. You know why that's important? Because if you're in your sins, you die and go to hell. If you're in here today and you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are dead in your sins. A Christian is not in his sins. When a Christian gets saved, he's in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You, Old Lord. things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Thank the Lord that Jesus Christ came up from the dead. Amen. If Jesus Christ did not come up from the dead, there's no atonement for sins. If Jesus Christ did not come up from the dead, no one else is coming up from the dead. And if Jesus Christ did not come up from the dead, there is no hope for anyone. No one has hope. Uh, you see what he says in verse 19? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Our hope is not just in this life. Our hope's in the next life. Yeah. You know, I've attended the bedsides of people as they were getting ready to uh, pass on and go home to glory, and I've been around some saved folks as they get ready to die, and man, there's just something special about it. Just something special. There's a hope that's there. One time I was over next door at the, uh, at the Springs, it's called the Solstice now, and I was over there and there was a fellow who was in his 90s, and uh, I used to do the, uh, uh, the, the Friday night service that uh, Brother Rob, Brother George do now. And one night they told me, they said, hey, pastor, they said, there's a guy, he's dying, and they want to know if you could just come by and attend his bedside for a few minutes. So I said, all right. So I walked down the hall, and uh, the family was there, and so hospice had been called in, and so he was, he was dying. And I said, I uh, went to him, the, I mean, when, you're, when you go to the bedside of someone, you don't, don't waste any time. Just, you know, I get right to the point. And I said, listen, uh, I said, uh, thank you for having me uh, come in. I'm a, I'm a preacher. I said, I, I have to ask you, I'll just be straightforward and honest with you. Sir, you're about ready to die, and, and when you die, are you certain where you're going to go when you die? Smile spread across his face, and he shook his head, and he says, yes, I am. So I quizzed him a little bit to make sure, and oh yeah, man, he was, a, he was saved. <laughs> he is a saint of God, and so I said, well, sir, I don't know exactly what to do for you, because you're, you're saved. I guess all I can do for you is just, I'll sing. How's that? And he shook his head. So I began to sing some of the old hymns, you know, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound that Saved a Wretch Like Me. I sang things like It Is Well With My Soul, and I was trying to say any old royal cross, anything that come to mind, and that old man was just singing there, uh, laying there in his bed, and he was whispering those tunes with me. And then about 30 minutes after I left, that man stepped off into glory. You know what that man had? He had hope. He had hope. What gives a man hope? If Jesus Christ didn't come up from the dead, there is no hope. But he did come up from the dead. There's hope. That's why it's important, the importance of the resurrection. I want to talk about the power of the resurrection. Notice in verse 20, verse 20, we'll take uh, the next uh, set of verses, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Oh, I don't want to talk about the power of the resurrection. Notice it only took one man to defeat death, just one man. And that was the man, Christ Jesus. He defeated, one man defeated death for all of us. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that he tasted death for every man. You think about that. Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. This world is afraid to die. They're afraid of it. They will do everything they can to hold on to this life. You guys remember when the COVID thing hit and everybody was wearing the masks and everybody was freaked out. 
I mean, there were some people who were so freaked out, they would not leave their homes. When anything would come to their home, they would have the person put it on, uh, uh, leave it outside. They would don something next to a hazmat suit on, go out there and get that stuff, bring it inside their home, wipe everything down. Remember, wipe all that, remember all that stuff? People wiping all that stuff off and then taking, depackaging it, throwing the stuff, getting it out of their home, then going and taking a shower and putting those clothes in the washing machine. They want to do everything they could to protect their life because something they could not see was in the air and might get to them and attack them. Something that was so small, so microscopic, they could not see and they were afraid for their life and they were willing to do whatever it took to save this life. Job knew this and he said, all that a man hath will they give for his life. You see, it is natural instinct within people to do whatever it takes to hold on to this life. If you don't know that's to be so about yourself, just hold your breath underwater for a while and your lungs will begin to burst and you have to get air. And next thing you know, you're popping up. You need some air. There's something inside of you that screams for life. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is something that entered into this world by one man. It's microscopic. You cannot see it, but it has infected every single person in the entire world. The man who it came in by was a fellow by the name of Adam. Remember that when he ate of the tree and he ate of that and partook of it and his wife ate also. Remember that? Well, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. The thing that I'm talking about, the disease that I'm talking about that has infected the entire human race is not racism. It's not politics. It's not class. It's not money. It's sin. Every single person is infected by sin. That is why our world is the way it is today. You want to know why all the trouble's happening? Sin. And sin will kill you not only here in this life, but it'll kill you in the next one as well. The Bible talks about a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That, you know what that is. I worked on a job site. I worked construction for years. I know that construction men know what that is because they have told me to go there. <laughs> I just look at them and say, I can't. I'm saved. <laughs> and you can be too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that if you want to boil it down, the problem with man is sin. That's the problem. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and one day you will die. Then what? If you die in your sins without the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. You will end up in the lake of fire, which is called the second death. Now, one man got us into that situation. That was Adam, but one man got us out. <laughs> the power of the resurrection. Notice now in verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Amen. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You know what the power of the resurrection is? <laughs> the power of the resurrection is so powerful that one day the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy death. Yeah. The thing that people fear the most, they fear dying. Yeah. Now, you're all going to die. <laughs> we got quiet. <laughs> cheer up, children. You're going to die. <laughs> If you're, if you're saved, that's, that, that should cheer you up. If you're, if you're lost, that, that, that doesn't cheer you up. But we can tell you how to be cheerful about that. <laughs> you know, one day the thing that people fear the most, death, God is going to wipe that out all because Jesus Christ defeated the most powerful enemy. He defeated death. I mean, there's a lot of powerful enemies. You take, you know, countries, get really strong, really powerful countries, and, uh, and you, have, uh, you have people can have a lot of power, but nobody is as powerful as death. And Jesus Christ defeated that. Amen. There's power in the resurrection. There's power in the resurrection. Notice what he says in verse uh, 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? But if, uh, so why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, I don't know if I necessarily understand what this baptism for the dead is. I know what it's not, and it's not what the Mormons teach. It's definitely not that. 
You're not being baptized in the place of dead people to try to save them. All right, so here it is. If the dead don't come up, then, then why, is, why are they baptized for the dead? All right, I'll give you my best explanation of this. You realize when someone is baptized, they are standing in the water like this, representing the death of Jesus Christ. When they go down in the water like that, they represent the burial, and when they come up like that, they represent the resurrection. If all Jesus Christ did was die and was buried, how come the baptism doesn't go like this? Right. <laughs> no, it goes like <laughs> up, up, why? up when the gravy arose. <laughs> Better hope you don't get a preacher who forgets the last line. Uh, what was it? And, uh, and uh, 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 hold on, brother, hold on, hold on. <laughs> All right, you know what the power of the resurrection does? It gives hope to others. It gives hope to others. All right, you know what the resurrection does? It gives hope to you and I. You, know, you can know this. I've uh, done funerals before, and when you do the funeral of somebody who's saved, boy, that sure is a blessing, especially when, man, when they had a really good, uh, lived a, uh, test, lived the testimony and witnessed to others, it's a, a real blessing. You can point at that uh, person and say, look, that's just a shell, that's not them, but one day we know we're going to see them again. Uh, you know what the resurrection does? The power of the resurrection does? It gives us hope. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever lost a loved one, if they were saved, you had sorrow, which is natural, but you didn't sorrow as people that have no hope. You know you're going to see them one day. All right, now you notice what also the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, it gives courage. It gives courage. Verse 30, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it, advantageth it, it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for uh, tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communication, corrupt good manners. Now, you know what uh, the resurrection does? It, it gives courage. It gives courage. Uh, when we stand out there on the street corner and we say, the Bible says ye must be born again, we can stand out there with confidence. Amen. You say, well, what if somebody uh, is angry at you and doesn't like it? Well, that's, that's normal. But when we stand out there and we say, you must be born again, we can have courage. We have courage. Why? Because we know what we're saying is true. Right. We know what we're saying is even if our life was on the line, yeah. we know that what we're saying is true and right. Yeah. Many people have laid down their lives for that. They've laid down their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Missionaries have gone over to the mission field and have stood there and tried to tell people about Jesus Christ and with love and compassion told them about how Jesus Christ died for their sins. And many of them were gunned down or taken and eaten by cannibals or had things happen to them. But they gave, they gave their life. What gave them the courage? The fact that Jesus came up. You know, it's like a preacher one time when the, when the guy pulled the gun and put it in his face, face he goes, don't threaten me with heaven. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you realize that if you die, if you're saying you die, <laughs> the best is yet to come. Amen. You know, with the devil, he gives you the best up front, yeah. and you're always chasing it. Yeah. Well, with the Lord, it just keeps getting gooder and gooder <laughs> <laughs> All right, please look with me now in verse 35. I would like to show you the transformation because of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. Now I'm going to have to go through this quickly. He says, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool. That would... Paul wasn't a very nice preacher. <laughs> Thou fool, calling people names. That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it dies. You take, now we're city slickers here, most of us, uh, but if you ever had a garden or if some of you grew up on a farm, you know that in order for something to grow, in order for there to be life, a seed has to go into the ground and has to die in the ground before life can happen. Well, before life could happen, somebody had to die. And Jesus Christ died, he went in the ground and he came up. All right, now he's asking, what body do they come up with? Verse 37, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. So, notice first of all that death must happen. So death must happen for every one of us in here. Uh, the Bible says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die. 
it, it's going to happen. Whether or not you want it to happen, it will happen. If you're saved and the Lord tarries and uh, we go out in the rapture, boy, that would be a blessing. And I think every generation has thought that the Lord was going to come in their generation. But I tell you what, man, I really think he's coming in our generation. <laughs> uh, we are close, man. We're like on the threshold. I can, I can hear, I, if you listen real carefully, you can hear them tuning up the trumpet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Now, death's going to happen. Death's going to happen. The Bible says, and as it is appointed unto men, once to die. Once to die. You die one time. You don't die. Come back in a reincarnated form. Live a life to try to then come and be reincarnated back as a better life form. The Bible says, as it is appointed unto men, once to die. Death is inevitable. Are you ready to die? You know, the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? I'm prepared. You say, well, you, well, that's because you're a preacher and you've done a lot of really good stuff. Oh, I had nothing to do with that. Right. I'm not prepared because I've done anything good. I'm prepared because I have Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you prepared? Amen. Don't try to meet God on your own. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Yes. If you try to meet God on your own and stand in your own righteousness, you'll never, you'll never measure up. You'll never measure up. All right, now notice, uh, notice that death must happen. Now notice that there's a change in body. There's a change in body. In verse 37, it told you that the seed goes into the ground. You take that seed, you put it into the ground, but when it comes up, it comes up different than it went down. Verse 38, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Then he begins to list out the different types of bodies. And he, he lets you know that there's a difference between a celestial body and a terrestrial body, celestial being up in the heavens, terrestrial being like tierra, being here on the earth. And so there's, there's a difference between them. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're saved, one day when you come up, you're coming up with a different body. Amen. You know, the Bible says it doth not yet appear we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's a change in body. There's a change in body. Boy, I sure am glad because uh, this body is wearing out. Amen. This body hurts. This body is not, uh, you know, I, I keep telling myself, oh, you can do that. No, you can't. <laughs> Try to do some things, and I, I did them. You know, I remember doing them, and I, up here I can do them. <laughs> but then I try to do them. I, oh, ow, you know. Of course, you can't do that in front of the fellows. You have to be, oh, I just, I need some water. <laughs> Man, well, I'm coming with a new body one day. Man, well, that's a, that's a promise. That's a promise. You know, uh, I want to uh, tell you this, that there, there not only does it appear that, uh, so I know that a Christian is get a, getting a, a new body. Uh, one day we'll be like our father. Uh, and you know, there's uh, some verses in scripture, and I don't have time to go over them now, but there's some verses in scripture that appear that when a lost man dies, he ends up like his father. The Bible talks about it being like a worm, where the worm dieth not and the fire is, uh, the fire is not quenched. And one day I'm going to look just like the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're lost, one day it appears you're going to look just like your father. Yeah. You say, well, who's my father? According to Jesus Christ, your father is the devil. Yeah. I, I realize uh, it's supposed to be Easter Sunday and I'm, I'm, I, sh I should be a little bit nicer. But I want to tell you the truth. And the truth is, is that the devil does not want you to hear the good news. He wants you to hear my tone of voice. He wants you to hear the angry things I'm saying, if that's the way you're taking them, but they're not done in anger, I promise you. He does not want you to, he doesn't want you to believe the gospel because he doesn't want to lose you. And so he will tell you whatever you got to be told and make you hear whatever you got to hear. You know what the Bible says he's done? He's blinded the minds. He's blinded the minds of those that don't believe because he does not want you to be saved because he doesn't care about you. The devil hates you. The devil hates you so much, he would be willing to destroy you. And you see that all around the world. You see that with little children being destroyed because of sin. You see that where homes are being split up. The devil doesn't care about you. The devil doesn't care about this church. The devil doesn't care about your wife or your husband or your grandma or your, or your grandpa. He doesn't care about any of them. He cares about one thing. He doesn't want you to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. The devil cares about souls. He cares about damning them to hell. That's what he cares about. 
You say, how do you know that? Because he would take such an interest, such an interest in stopping you from getting the gospel that he will right now, as I'm talking to you, the unclean spirits will try to snatch the word out of the air so you won't hear it. He will stop a missionary who will spend his entire life trying to get over to some little tribe over in Africa or down in South America that doesn't know the gospel. He will do everything he can to stop them from taking the gospel down to people who will never have more of an impact than in their little square mile that they live in. He cares about souls so much he wants to damn them to hell. But God cares about your soul so much that he stepped off of his throne, laying aside those robes, curled himself in a garment of flesh, lived a sinless life for 33 and a half years, did what you and I could not do, and then with nothing but love and compassion for those who are beating him, went to the cross and shed his blood for your sins and mine. And when it was all said and done, after three days and three nights, after they made the tomb as sure as they can, up from the grave he rose. The Lord cares about you cares about you. There's a transformation. There's a change in body. There's a change in energy. Thank the Lord for that because I feel you guys are really tame this morning. <laughs> Notice in verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Glory Do you realize the body that we come up in has a, there's a change in the energy that we have? <laughs> you know what our energy does? Our energy runs down. You got to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> I, I know some of you, you drink the energy drinks and you try, try to stay awake that way. But oh, you can only do that for so long. <laughs> and eventually, I mean, I've read stories about, about uh, generals in the Civil War who would be fighting on the battlefield for, I mean, just going and going and going. And then all of a sudden, they would literally just boom, fall over and their body couldn't, and they would sleep. They just couldn't take them more. Down they go and they'd sleep. And they couldn't help it. Their body just stopped. Well, could you imagine all of a sudden... <laughs> You get a body and oh, yeah. it's like a surge of energy you never felt in your life. I never felt this before. And you don't have flesh to contend with. You, no bad thoughts are flying through your mind. Nothing but purity. Nothing but purity. You can literally just, just have diarrhea of the mouth and you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about saying anything bad. If you are anything like me, I, I, have, I, 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 I have taken my foot, stuck it in my mouth, and just chewed vigorously. And then to make it worse, when I saw what I was doing, I chewed even more. You know what I'm talking about? Where you just, you just mouth, you just keep talking. After a while, just shh. I actually used to write myself notes. Bite your tongue. I had to literally bite my tongue. One day, I'm going to get home to glory, and I'm not to worry about any of that. Amen. Man, I'm going to have a body one day. You see this body in front of you. I, I'm not coming up with this body. Amen. This body is going down in the ground with aches and pains and hurt, but one day it's coming up raised in power. <laughs> you think these guys running around? Man, you wait, wait, wait one day. You'll see. You'll, you'll see. There's a change in image. Notice in verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's who we're preaching to you this morning. I'm not preaching to you a man who is the brother of Lucifer. Do you understand? Jesus Christ is not the brother of Lucifer. I'm not preaching to that Christ. I'm not preaching to you a man who is just a socialist activist. I'm not preaching to you that man. I'm not, that's not my Jesus. My Jesus is God Almighty. God manifest in the flesh. That's who we're preaching to you this morning. You say, why is that important? Because man, if he wasn't God, he wasn't coming up. He would just be like any other man. We are preaching to you about the Lord of heaven. Listen carefully. That's why the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. That's who we're preaching. And if you don't confess that Jesus Christ is Lord now, you will confess it one day. Yeah. 
You realize the Bible says that no man can say by the Spirit that Jesus Christ is the Lord, except it be by the Spirit. Yeah. Just saying Jesus is Lord is not necessarily of the Spirit, because the devil's going to say that one day. In Philippians chapter 2, the devil's going to get on his knees and say, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. You know, there's a fella, he's a thief, and he's hanging on a cross, and he looks over at Jesus, and he calls him Lord. Yeah. Now, that's only in the King James. Only the King James, all right? If you have a new Bible, you can look in that text, and he calls him Jesus. They literally take his lordship away from him. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the Lord. That's who we're preaching to you today. He's the Lord from heaven. All right, notice uh, in verse 48, as is the earth, such are they also that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody talks about how we are all image bearers of God. I don't know if you heard that before. We're Im God's image bearers. Listen, when God made man, he made man in his own image. That's found in book of Genesis, I think it was chapter 2, chapter 1, chapter 2, made man in his own image. When Adam sinned and his son was born in Genesis 5, it tells you in your Bible that he was born in Adam's image. You see, the image was lost. The image was lost because of sin. And every one of us were born in Adam's image. Something is wrong inside. But Jesus Christ is the image of God. Yeah. And when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the image is restored yeah. because He's the image of God. Yeah. Ain't that something? Yeah. All right, now let's talk about the last thing here. Let's talk about the promise from the resurrection. Now for the good part. Yeah. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall, all, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, and this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right, the promise from the resurrection. First thing I have to say about this promise is this promise is a mystery. It says in verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. This is a mystery. A mystery is something that you def don't uh, necessarily understand, but you believe it. You believe it, why? Because God said it. <laughs> I mean, the Lord said that one day, if your body goes in the ground, and we have to have your funeral, and we're all weeping over it and say, man, you know, we sure do miss brother uh, so-and-so, or we're going to miss sister so-and-so, and we're going to have all these nice conversations about you and say all these good things about you there around your, uh, your uh, graveside there. Uh, you know what hope we have is this. The hope we have that as we're saying all this stuff about you, that that body is just a shell, and one day when a trumpet sounds, that body is going to be changed, and it's going to come up incorruptible. You say, uh, explain that to, to me. I can't explain it. It's a mystery, but I believe it because God's Word said it was so. You know, there's a, there's a song, God said it, and I believe it. And that settles it for me. You ever, you ever heard that song? You know, and people sing that song. Actually, the real thing is God said it, that settles it whether or not you believe it. <laughs> That's the real way that thing goes. All right, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. You know what else it is? It's a moment. 
in verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. These are all definitive words. You don't even have to go to the Greek. <laughs> you can just read the English, and it's all very plain and simple what's going to happen. This is definitive, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Amen. Are you ready for a demonstration? I'm going to show you how fast that is. Ready? <laughs> that fast. That fast. All of a sudden, we're all sitting here, and we're, we're, we're talking, having a good time. Bada ba bum ba bum blinking. Woo! <laughs> in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize in a half of a second, in a millisecond, your life could be completely different? I realize what some of you are probably thinking. Some of you are probably thinking, uh, I actually have some taxes that I need to get to. And I'm worried the IRS is not going to get their money. The IRS can have it all. <laughs> Take it, man. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> some of you say, well, I got plans. I got things I want to do. Man, what could be better than getting out of here? <laughs> I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I have... I, I was going to say I have bought a one-way ticket, but actually I've bought a return ticket. <laughs> I'm going up. I'm going up like Superman, but like the song said, I'm coming back like a Lone Ranger. <laughs> it's in a moment. It's in a moment. Notice the immortality that's talked about in verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. I don't understand that. I understand that, but I know that one day after a body is dead and decomposed and in the ground, the worms have eaten it and uh, everything is uh, gone with this individual, one day when the Lord comes back, that mortal body must put on immortality if they're saved. If you're not saved, if you're not saved, you're, you have no part in this. If you're not saved, what awaits you is nothing but hell for all eternity. Somebody said life, uh, 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 um, eternity will be hell without Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, that's what your destination is. But just to, let, us, let us indulge, us Christians. We're going to indulge for just a moment. And we hope that you'll get saved today so you can enjoy this moment as well. One day this body is going to come up on the ground. The Lord's going to assemble. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to change it. And this mortal must put on immortality. I'm never going to die again. It's not like I'm going to repeat some cycle. No, I'm going to come up and have eternal life. As a matter of fact, I've got eternal life right now. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I'm not even guessing. I know it. And I didn't even have to go to the Greek. <laughs> I know. I got it, man. I got it. <laughs> Now notice the victory about this resurrection. The victory is found in uh, verse, we'll start in verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Christian has the victory. He says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Amen. You know why sting, uh, death doesn't have a sting for a Christian? Because the Lord took the stinger for us. Yeah, he Lord. took the stinger for us. Grave doesn't have, any, have the victory over us because the Lord, the Lord got victory over the grave. Yeah. You know, I like to think about the rapture. I, I just love thinking about it. I love thinking, what is it going to be like when a rapture takes place? And I imagine it's going to be like nothing like I've thought. I drive down the road sometimes. I see the clouds, and man, they look really beautiful. Especially when the sun's shining through it, and I kind of try to look, and I say, you know, is he gonna, is he gonna pop in right there, you know? Because <laughs> I think he's gonna be, I think he's gonna show up right where I'm looking, you know. Like, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna be doing that. I have no idea. I, I don't, I don't know. But in my mind's eye, my mind's eye, when I begin to think about this thing, I think, man, what if I'm just doing the, the normal routine? Well, I'm getting up in the morning, I'm sitting there, and I'm reading my Bible, and as I read the Bible, oh man, it's beautiful fellowship. Just love reading that thing. Then go and talk to the Lord in prayer. Lord, man, it's so good. And I wonder what that particular day, I wonder what it's going to be like. I wonder if the Bible reading and prayer is going to be just a little bit different. I wonder if all of a sudden I'm just not going to have feel something down in my heart that says, uh, it's today. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> 
Now, I wonder if the birds aren't just going to be singing a little bit sweeter. The flowers look a little prettier. The mountains seem to be a little bit better looking. I uh, hear all the gray we have. I know it's raining now, so we have a lot of greenery. It's really nice here in California right now. But I wonder if it's not just something going to be a little bit nicer. Or maybe, or maybe it won't be a little nicer. Maybe all of a sudden it'll seem like that beautiful flower grows a little bit dim. Maybe it seems like those plans that I have just kind of just seem a little dull. Maybe it seems like the world around me just grows a little bit grayer. And all of a sudden, the clouds appear up in the sky. And something in my heart begins to pound within me and say, man, this world is growing dim. But oh, that's looking good. About that time, we hear a trumpet. Man, when that trumpet sounds, the Bible says at the last trump. So I imagine if it's the last trump, there has to be another trump before it. Now, that's not the seven trumpets over in Revelation. Don't get confused with that. But I just wonder, is there going to be, maybe all of a sudden we'll hear, ba ba bum ba da ba da ba bum ba da ba da ba da ba da I don't know what it's going to be, man. But I know that it says that last trump. And the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. I know some of you have said, man, I, I, I want to be alive when the rapture takes place because I don't want to miss the rapture. You won't miss it. If you die, your body goes in the ground, but then you come up first. Then we join you. You ain't going to miss it. Man, that trumpet sounds. Man, up we begin to go and rise, and you just feel this flesh peeling itself off, the world peeling itself off. You see, there's your Savior, the one who loved you, the one who died for you, the one who gave his life that you've been singing about all these years. I knew it was real. I knew it was true. There he is. And off we soar to be with our Savior. This is a promise that we have. There's victory. There's victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says there's victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, which means that's only where victory is found. It's not found outside Jesus Christ. Listen carefully. If you're lost in here today, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You, can, I'm not pre you understand I'm not preaching your religion here today? Yeah. I'm not going to call you down and ask you to join our church because that won't save you. Yeah. I'm not even going to have a, baptist, a baptism afterwards because baptism won't save you. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you to put your money in the offering plate. If you think that putting money in the offering plate will save you, you let us know. We'll give you your money back. Yeah. My treasurer will be like, what? No, we'll, <laughs> we'll give it back to you. If you think that that earns you something with God, take it back. Because putting money in the offering plate is not going to save anybody. It cannot buy you favor with God. The Bible says we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious Amen. blood of Christ. Amen. That's what we're redeemed by. You can't get in any other way. I think it was Brother Mike preaching one day, and he said, you can't go around them, you can't go uh, over them, you can't go under them, you got to go through them. <laughs> Victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to end the sermon today with a charge. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Christians, listen up. Anything you do for the Lord is not in vain. Think about that for just a moment. So be steadfast, unmovable. You know what some of you are? Some of you are like, oh, I don't know if it's worth it. And I, that world is kind of pulling me this way. Hey, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You say, but I got this sin that's pulling me that way. Well, victory is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to him for help. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. One day we're promised we're going to see him, and we're going to see him face to face. I'm going to see him just as I am seeing you right now. And I'll see him in all his glory, in all his splendor, being praised by the angels and the cherubims and the seraphims, now watch as the 24 elders couldn't contain themselves, yeah. fall down on their face, casting their crowns, and I can do nothing but help and join them and fall flat on my face. 
as the stars in the sky and the galaxy just sing His praises and just exalt His glory, one day words cannot do justice to what I will see one day. Christians, we have not believed in vain. This is not some cunningly devised fable. This is real. I bet my life on it. I bet my soul on it. I bet my eternal destiny on it. If you're not saved, will you take the bet as well? Will you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? One day we're getting out of here. Let's all stand. Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning. Lord, uh, I asked you for three things today. I asked you to glorify the Savior. And Father, I feel that you did that. I asked that you'd edify the saint. And by the reaction, I'm guessing that that was done. Lord, I also asked that you'd evangelize the sinner. And Lord, I know that you said in your word that if uh, Jesus Christ was lifted up, he'd draw men unto you. And he was lifted up. And I know there's a, if someone is lost in here today, there's a tug on their heart that they need what we're talking about. And they don't want to face death uh, without knowing what's on the other side. They don't want to face it alone. They don't have to. So Father, I pray if somebody is here today, they don't have their sins forgiven. Lord, may they... See that Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Father, may they answer the call, because this is a a choice they have to make, Lord. There's a free will. Uh, They're not going to be forced into doing it. Uh, Lord, we'd like to make it as easy as possible if somebody is interested in this today. May uh, May they accept the invitation and trust Christ as their Savior. Lord, we'll give them an opportunity to come forward. Let us take a Bible and show them how to be saved. Now, head bowed and eyes are closed.